In that instant, Paul saw how Stilgar had been transformed from the Fremen leader to a creature of the Lisan al Gayib, a receptacle for awe and obedience. It was a lessening of the man, and Paul felt the ghost wind of the jihad in it. Whenever I saw Stilgar in part two, I couldn't help but recall this quote from the first book. While his fanaticism made some people laugh, for me, those scenes were a reminder of a deeper tragedy. Of course, Javier Bardem's amazing performance brings out a more humorous side of Stilgar, making him a source of some comic relief. But while his zealotry may seem amusing on the surface, a deeper look reveals one of the saddest aspects of the entire story. The story of a desperate man, blinded by both hope and faith. In fact, at the beginning of the story, Stilgar stands out as a wise and capable leader who is respected by his people and widely considered as the voice of the Fremen. He's the kind of leader who always puts his people first, and that's something Paul really admires. However, as he becomes convinced Paul is the Lisan al-Gaib, the qualities that once defined him slowly fade away. Just like Paul, we witness him fall into a blind faith. And the saddest part is that we can't even blame him, because no matter how extreme it seems, he has enough reason to believe. Because Stilgar is a man of tradition, and even his initial doubts couldn't completely silence the tales of the Lisan al-Gaib. Deep down, a part of him hopes that Paul and Jessica are the answer to those old prophecies. After all, the Fremen believe their promised savior will be a child born of a Bene Gesserit. So naturally, Paul and Lady Jessica draw his attention. Maybe they're the sign of freedom the Fremen have been hoping for. At this point, we need to understand why Stilgar and the Fremen desperately yearn for a savior. It's because both Stilgar and the Fremen desperately want liberation and the ecological transformation of Arrakis. And it's important to note that this promise is what keeps them alive in such a cruel world. For many, this hope is their only inspiration. It's what they dream of when sleep at night, their only hope for a better future and less suffering. And when the signs grow more tangible than before, this hope suddenly becomes absolute and fanatical. Stilgar's sudden change into a fanatic actually shows us how vulnerable the Fremen are and how deeply the seeds of propaganda have been sown. The first sign that the prophecy might be true hits Stilgar when Paul kills Jamis. This outsider, this young boy who has never killed a man, somehow defeats a Fremen warrior. Stilgar can't shake the feeling that there is more to Paul than meets the eye, and he begins to see Paul's actions through the lens of the prophecy. Over time, the man once wanted to kill Jessica, comes to desire her as his people's reverend mother. Remember the scene in C.H. Tabor where Jessica and Stilgar talk about the death of the current reverend mother? In a way, Stilgar offers Jessica a choice, become the Reverend Mother or die in the desert. He almost forces her to fulfill the prophecy he believes in. This belief is so strong that despite Paul's denials, he twists his words into confirmation, claiming the true Mahdi would never proclaim himself. And this kind of approach actually shows us something dangerous. When someone believes in something strongly enough, it becomes almost impossible to change their mind. But the tricky part is that Stilgar isn't a delusional man because the prophecies unfold right before his eyes. As it is written, this outsider boy easily masters the desert ways and it only makes Stilgar's faith grow stronger. And only after Paul rides a sandworm and fulfills an ancient legend, his faith becomes absolute. From then on, it doesn't matter what Paul believes, Stilgar does. Their journey to the south, Paul's survival of the water of life and his undeniable visions only deepen Stilgar's conviction. At the end, he becomes someone who would gladly die for Paul, allowing himself to be consumed by the religion surrounds him. But if you take a closer look, Stilgar's behavior exactly fits the definition of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This makes even more sense when you consider that this entire savior narrative is a made-up story. Basically, a self-fulfilling prophecy is a belief that influences behavior in a way that makes the belief come true. According to psychologist Robert Merton, a fiction can become real if enough people believe in it, because they might interpret events or even act in ways that align with the fictional narrative. And on a planet like Arrakis, where belief is essential for survival, people desperately want a prophecy to come true. This leads them to reinterpret events to fit the prophecy, or like Stilgar, actively shape circumstances to make it happen. Yet the Bene Gesserit cleverly exploit this psychology. They sow the seeds of a messiah myth, and the Fremen find themselves trapped in a cycle of bringing that myth to life. So this is how Paul becomes their supposed savior. His story might start as a lie, but the Bene Gesserit and the Fremen pave the way for it to become reality. From Stilgar's perspective, how could he not believe? Imagine spending your life waiting for a savior to liberate your people, and then someone arrives. 
someone who sees the future and promises freedom, how could you not believe that's real? But this is also where Stilgar's tragedy becomes tangible, because this supposed savior cannot truly fulfill his promises. A change comes, yes, but at a terrible price. Paul uses the Fremen to become emperor of the universe, but in the process sacrifices billions of lives. He frees the Fremen from the Empire's control, but he also traps them under the shadow of the Muad'Dib myth. However, for a long time, Stilgar refuses to see Paul's actions for what they are. He remains blindly loyal, clinging to the belief he once held, a belief that he served a cause greater than himself. Years spent in Paul's service bring him status and comfort, but as the new autocracy takes shape, his world crumbles. Even then, he can't bring himself to go against Paul or to defy his son Leto. Over time, Paul's holy war destroys the soul of the Fremen. The path turns destructive, and Stilgar fears the scorching sands will swallow the old ways, all that shaped his people. Deep down, he knows that something is terribly wrong. But only after Paul's death, he begins to question everything. He even finds himself thinking the unthinkable, killing Paul's children, Leto and Ganima. Yet a deep despair washes over him. It was too late. A new, twisted order had already taken root. In the days that follow, Stilgar watches the other Fremen leaders bend the knee to their new emperor, Leto II. They are filled with equal parts awe and terror. But Stilgar mourns for the gentle boy once he knew because Leto's transformation into an immortal worm god lies far beyond his understanding, and his dream is a future Stilgar would never comprehend. Only then, he realizes that he was a pawn in a game played by the forces beyond him, and the game was already over. But Stilgar mourns for his people as well. Even if he would not live to see it, he knows Leto's dream of the changes coming to Arrakis, and he wants no part in that new world. A world without worms, without the Fremen. A world where Shai Hulud's judgment holds no sway, that would mean the end of the Fremen life. Thousands of years after his death, Arrakis blooms. The paradise they had dreamed of finally arrives, but the price is everything, because there are no Fremen left to enjoy their new home. His people fade into oblivion, remembered only as an old story. And that's actually where Stilgar's tragedy reminds us that we're all part of a cycle we would never truly understand. It also shows us how life moves forward and that the universe has a design that surpasses our own plans. When we step back and see the bigger picture, even Stilgar's tragedy loses its meaning. The mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. A process that cannot be understood by stopping it. We must move with the flow of the process. We must join it. We must flow with it. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a comment, give a like, and click to subscribe. Your support will greatly help the mysterious algorithm notices me. And if you want to support me personally, you can join the channel by using the join button. See you next time.